Once upon a time the Aesir went to take dinner with old Aegir, the king of the ocean. Down under the green waves they went to the coral palace where Aegir lived with his wife, Queen Ran, and his daughters, the waves. But Aegir was not expecting so large a party to dinner, and he had not meat enough for them all to drink. I must brew some more mead, he said to himself. But when he came to look for a kettle in which to make the brew, there was none in all the sea large enough for the purpose. At first, Aegir did not know what to do, but at last he decided to consult the gods themselves, for he knew how wise and powerful his guests were, and he hoped that they might help him to a kettle. Now when he told the Aesir his trouble, they were much interested, for they were hungry and thirsty, and longed for some of Aegir's good mead. Where can we find a kettle? They said to one another. Who has a kettle huge enough to hold me for all the Aesir? Then Tyr the brave turned to Thor with a grand idea. My father, the giant Hymir, has such a kettle. I have seen it often in his great palace near Elivagar, the river of ice. This famous kettle is a mile deep, and surely that is large enough to brew all the mead we may need. Surely it is large enough, laughed Aegir. But how are we to get the kettle, my distinguished guests? Who will go to giant land to fetch the kettle a mile deep? That will I, said brave Thor. I will go to Hymir's dwelling and bring thence the little kettle, if Tyr will go with me to show me the way. So Thor and Tyr set out together, for the land of snow and ice, where the giant Hymir lived. They traveled long and they traveled fast. And finally they came to the huge house which had once been Tyr's home, before he went to live with the good folk in Asgard. Well Tyr knew the way to enter, and it was not long before they found themselves in the hall of Hymir's dwelling, peering about for some sign of the kettle which they had come so far to seek. And sure enough, presently they discovered eight huge kettles hanging in a row from one of the beams in the ceiling. While the two were wondering which kettle might be the one they sought, there came in Tyr's grandmother, and a terrible grandmother she was. No wonder that Tyr had run away from home when he was very little, for this dreadful creature was a giantess with nine hundred heads, each more ugly than the others, and her temper was as bad as were her looks. She began to roar and bellow, and no one knows what this evil old person would have done to her grandson and his friend had not there come into the hall at this moment another woman, fair and sweet, and glittering with golden ornaments. This was Tyr's good mother, who loved him dearly, and who had mourned his absence during long years. With a cry of joy she threw herself upon her son's neck, bidding him welcome forty times over. She welcomed Thor also when she found out who he was, but she sent away the wicked old grandmother, that she might not hear, for Thor's name was not dear to the race of giants, to so many of whom he had brought dole and death. Why have you come, dear son, after so many years? She cried. I know that some great undertaking calls you and this noble fellow to your father's hall. Danger and death wait here for such as you and he, and only some quest with glory for its reward could have brought you to such risks. Tell me your secret tear, and I will not betray it. Then they told her how that they had come to carry away the giant kettle, and Tyr's mother promised that she would help them all she could. But she warned them that it would be dangerous indeed, for that Hymir had been in a terrible temper for many days, and that the very sight of a stranger made him wild with rage. Hastily she gave them meat and drink, for they were nearly famished after their long journey. And then she looked around to see where she should hide them against Hymir's return, who was now away at the hunt. You shall hide in the great kettle itself, and if you escape Hymir's terrible eye, it may hap that you will find a way to make off with your hiding place, which is what you want. So the kind creature helped them to climb into the great kettle where it hung from one of the rafters in a row with seven others, but this one was the biggest and the strongest of them all, Hardly had they snuggled down out of sight, when Tyr's mother began to tremble. I hear him coming. Keep as still as ever you can, O oh, Tyr and Thor. The floor also began to tremble, and the eight kettles to clatter against one another, as Hymir's giant footsteps approached the house. Outside they could hear the iceberg shaking with a sound like thunder. Indeed, the whole earth quivered, as if with fear, when the terrible giant Hymir strode home from the hunt. came into the hall puffing and blowing, and immediately the air of the room grew chilly, for his beard was hung with icicles and his face was frosted hard, while his breath was a winter wind, a freezing blast. Wife, he growled, 
what news? For I see by the footprints in the snow outside that you have had visitors today. Then indeed the poor woman trembled, but she tried not to look frightened as she answered, Yes, you have a guest, O Hymir, a guest whom you have long wished to see. Your son Tyr has returned to visit his father's hall. Humph, growled Hymir, with a terrible frown. Whom has he brought here with him, the rascal? There are prints of two persons' feet in the snow. Come, wife, tell me all, for I shall soon find out the truth, whether or no. He has brought a friend of his, a dear friend, O oh, Hymir, faltered the mother. Surely, our son's friends are welcome when he brings them to this our home, after so long an absence. But Hymir howled with rage at the word, friend. Where are they hidden? He cried, friend, indeed. It is one of those bloody fellows from Asgard, I know, one of those giant killers whom my good mother taught me to hate with all my might. Let me get at him. Tell me instantly where he is hidden, or I will pull down the hall about your ears. Now when the wicked old giant spoke like this, his wife knew that he must be obeyed. Still she tried to put off the fateful moment of the discovery. They are standing over there behind that pillar, she said. Instantly Hymir glared at the pillar towards which she pointed and at his frosty glance the marble pillar cracked in two, and down crashed the great roof beam which held the eight kettles. Smash! went the kettles, and there they lay shivered into little pieces at Hymir's feet, all except one, the largest of them all, and that was the kettle in which Thor and Tyr lay hidden, scarcely daring to breathe lest the giant should guess where they were. Tyr's mother screamed when she saw the big kettle fall with the others, but when she found that this one, alone of them all, lay on its side unbroken because it was so tough and strong. She held her breath to see what would happen next. And what happened was this. Out stepped Thor and Tyr, and making low bows to Hymir, they stood side by side, smiling and looking as unconcerned as if they really enjoyed all this hubbub, and I dare say that they did indeed, being Tyr the Bold and Thor the Thunderer, who had been in giant land many times ere this. Hymir gave scarcely a glance at his son, but he eyed Thor with a frown of hatred and suspicion, for he knew that this was one of Father Odin's brave family, though he could not tell which one. However, he thought best to be civil, now that Thor was actually before him. So, with gruff politeness, he invited the two guests to supper. Now Thor was a valiant fellow at the table, as well as in war, and at sight of the good things on the board his eyes sparkled. Three roast oxen there were upon the giant's table, and Thor fell to with a will, and finished two of them himself. You should have seen the giant stare. Truly, friend, you have a goodly appetite, he said. You have eaten all the meat that I have in my larder, and if you dine with us tomorrow, I must insist that you catch your own dinner of fish. I cannot undertake to provide food for such an appetite. Now this was not hospitable of Hymir, but Thor did not mind. I like well to fish, good Hymir, he laughed, and when you fare forth with your boat in the morning, I will go with you and see what I can find for my dinner at the bottom of the sea. When the morning came, the giant made ready for the fishing, and Thor rose early to go with him. Ho, Hymir, exclaimed Thor, have you bait enough for us both? Hymir answered gruffly, you must dig your own bait when you go fishing with me. I have no time to waste on you. Then Thor looked about to see what he could use for bait, and presently he spied a herd of Hymir's oxen feeding in the meadow. Ah, just the thing, he cried, and seizing the hugest ox of all, he trotted down to the shore with it under his arm, as easily as you would carry a handful of clams for bait. When Hymir saw this, he was very angry. He pushed the boat off from shore and began to row away as fast as he could so that Thor might not have a chance to come aboard. But Thor made one long step and planted himself snugly in the stern of the boat. No, no, brother Hymir, he said laughing. You invited me to go fishing, and a fishing I will go, for I have my bait, and my hope is high that great luck I shall see this day. So he took an oar and rowed mightily in the stern, while Hymir the giant rowed mightily at the prow, and no one ever saw boats skip over the water so fast as this one did on the day when these two big fellows went fishing together. Far and fast they rode, until they came to a spot where Hymir cried, Hold, let us anchor here and fish. This is the place where I have best fortune. 
And what sort of little fish do you catch here, O Hymir? Asked Thor. Whales, answered the giant proudly. I fish for nothing smaller than whales. Pooh, cried Thor. Who would fish for such small fry? Whales, indeed, let us row out further, where we can find something really worth catching. And he began to pull even faster than before. Stop, stop, roared the giant. You do not know what you are doing. These are the haunts of the dreadful Midgard serpent, and it is not safe to fish in these waters. Oho, the Midgard serpent, said Thor, delighted. That is the very fish I am after. Let us drop in our lines here. Thor baited his great hook with the whole head of the ox which he had brought, and cast his line, big round as a man's arm, over the side of the boat. Hymir also cast his line, for he did not wish Thor to think him a coward, but his hand trembled as he waited for a bite, and he glanced down into the blue depths with eyes rounded as big as dinner plates, through fear of the horrible creature who lived down below those waves. Look, you have a bite, cried Thor, so suddenly that Hymir started and nearly tumbled out of the boat. Hand over hand he pulled in his line, and lo, he had caught two whales, two great flopping whales, on his one hook. That was a catch indeed. Hymir smiled proudly, forgetting his fear as he said, How was that, my friend? Let us see you beat this catch in your morning's fishing. Lo, just at that moment Thor also had a bite, such a bite. The boat rocked to and fro, and seemed ready to capsize every minute. Then the waves began to roll high, and to be lashed into foam for yards and yards about the boat, as if some huge creature were struggling hard below the water. I have him, shouted Thor. I have the old serpent, the brother of the Fenris wolf. Pull, pull, monster. But you shall not escape me now. Sure enough, the Midgard serpent had Thor's hook fixed in his jaw, and struggle as he might. There was no freeing himself from the line, for the harder he pulled the stronger grew Thor. In his easier might Thor waxed so huge and so forceful that his legs went straight through the bottom of the boat and his feet stood on the bottom of the sea. With firm bottom as a brace for his strength, Thor pulled and pulled, and at last up came the head of the Midgard serpent up to the side of the boat where it thrust out of the water mountain high. Dreadful to behold, his monstrous red eyes were rolling fiercely his nostrils spouted fire, and from his terrible sharp teeth dripped poison that sizzled as it fell into the sea. Angrily they glared at each other, Thor and the serpent, while the water streamed into the boat, and the giant turned pale with fear at the danger threatening him on all sides. Thor seized his hammer, preparing to smite the creature's head, but even as he swung Mjolnir high for the fatal blow, Hymir cut the fish line with his knife, and down into the depths of ocean sank the Midgard serpent amid a whirlpool of eddies. But the hammer had sped from Thor's iron fingers. It crushed the serpent's head as he sank downward to his lair on the sandy bottom. It crushed, but did not kill him, thanks to the giant's treachery. Terrible was the disturbance it caused beneath the waves. It burst the rocks and made the caverns of the ocean shiver into bits. It wrecked the coral groves and tore loose the draperies of seaweed. The fishes scurried about in every direction and the sea monsters wildly sought new places to hide themselves when they found their homes destroyed. The sea itself was stirred to its lowest depths, and the waves ran trembling into one another's arms. The earth, too, shrank and shivered. Hymir, cowering low in the boat, was glad of one thing, which was that the terrible Midgard serpent had vanished out of sight, and that was the last that was ever seen of him, though he still lived, wounded and sore from the shock of Thor's hammer. Now it was time to return home. Silently and sulkily the giant swam back to land, Thor, bearing the boat upon his shoulders, filled with water and waited as it was with the great whales which Hymir had caught, waded ashore, and brought his burden to the giant's hall. Here Hymir met him crossly enough, for he was ashamed of the whole morning's work, in which Thor had appeared so much more of a hero than he. Indeed, he was tired of even pretending hospitality towards this unwelcome guest, and was resolved to be rid of him. But first he would put Thor to shame. You are a strong fellow, he said, good at the oar and at the fishing, most wondrously good at the hammer, by which I know that you are Thor. But there is one thing which you cannot do, I warrant. You cannot break this little cup of mine, hard though you may try. That I shall see for myself, answered Thor, and he took the cup in his hand. Now this was a magic cup, and there was but one way of breaking it but one thing hard enough to shatter its mightiness. 
Thor threw it with all his force against a stone of the flooring, but instead of breaking the cup, the stone itself was cracked into splinters. Then Thor grew angry, for the giant and all his servants were laughing as if this were the greatest joke ever played. Try again, Thor, cried Hymir, nearly bursting with delight, for he thought that now he should prove how much mightier he was than the visitor from Asgard. Thor clutched the cup more firmly and hurled it against one of the iron pillars of the hall, but like a rubber ball the magic cup merely bounded back straight into Hymir's hand. At this second failure, the giants were full of merriment and danced about, making all manner of fun at the expense of Thor. You can fancy how well Thor the Mighty enjoyed this. His brow grew black, and the glance of his eye was terrible. He knew there was some magic in the trick, but he knew not how to meet it. Just then he felt the soft touch of a woman's hand upon his arm, and the voice of Tyr's mother whispered in his ear, Cast the cup against Hymer's own forehead, which is the hardest substance in the world. No one except Thor heard the woman say these words, for all the giant folk were doubled up with mirth over their famous joke. But Thor dropped upon one knee, and seizing the cup fiercely, whirled it about his head, then dashed it with all his might straight at Hymer's forehead. What had happened? Thor looked eagerly to see. There stood the giant, looking surprised and a little dazed, but his forehead showed not even a scratch, while the strong cup was shivered into little pieces. Well done, exclaimed Hymir hastily, when he had recovered a little from his surprise. But he was mortified at Thor's success, and set about to think up a new task to try his strength. That was very well, he remarked patronizingly, now you must perform a harder task. Let us see you carry the mead kettle out of the hall. Do that, my fine fellow, and I shall say you are strong indeed. The mead kettle. The very thing Thor had come to get. He glanced at Tyr, he shot a look at Tyr's mother, and both of them caught the sparkle, which was very like a wink. To himself Thor muttered, I must not fail in this. I must not, will not fail. First let me try, cried Tyr, for he wanted to give Thor time for a resting spell. Twice Tyr the mighty strained at the great kettle, but he could not so much as stir one leg of it from the floor where it rested. He tugged and heaved in vain, growing red in the face, till his mother begged him to give over, for it was quite useless. Then Thor stepped forth upon the floor. He grasped the rim of the kettle and stamped his feet through the stone of the flooring as he braced himself to lift. One, two, three. Thor straightened himself and up swung the giant kettle to his head while the iron handle clattered about his feet. It was a mighty burden, and Thor staggered as he started for the door. But Tyr was close beside him, and they had covered long leagues of ground on their way home before the astonished giants had recovered sufficiently to follow them. When Thor and Tyr looked back, however, they saw a vast crowd of horrible giants, some of them with a hundred heads, swarming out of the caverns in Hymir's land, howling and prowling upon their track. You must stop them, Thor, or they will never let us get away with their precious kettle. They take such long strides, cried Tyr. So Thor set down the kettle, and from his pocket drew out Mjolnir, his wondrous hammer. Terribly it flashed in the air as he swung it over his head. Then forth it flew towards Jotunheim, and before it returned to Thor's hand it had crushed all the heads of those many-headed giants, Hymir's ugly mother, and Hymir himself among them. The only one who escaped was the good and beautiful mother of Tyr, and you may be sure she lived happily ever after in the palace which Hymir and his wicked old mother had formerly made so wretched a home for her. Now Tyr and Thor had the giant kettle which they had gone so far and had met so many dangers to obtain. They took it to Agir's sea palace, where the banquet was still going on, and where the Aesir were still waiting patiently for their mead, for time does not go so fast below the quiet waves as on shore. Now that King Agir had the great kettle, he could brew all the mead they needed. So everyone thanked Tyr and congratulated Thor upon the success of their adventure. I was sure that Thor would bring the kettle, said fair Sif, smiling upon her brave husband. What Thor sets out to do, that he always accomplishes, said Father Odin gravely. And that was praise enough for anyone. 